winning cures everything. Here are your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything, number 110. This is the Friday, August 11th edition of the show. I am Gary, my co-host is Chris. On today's show, we've got Dan Walken from USA Today talking about Ole Miss's lawsuit with Houston Nutt being thrown out and the release of the NCAA response to the school. Chris and I break down Josh Rosen's comments about how football and school don't go together. And we bring in a new segment called the Friday Five. Today we discuss political correctness, Zach Randolph being arrested, Deshaun Watson is awesome, an inflatable chicken in front of the White House, and Les Miles is back, baby. Now, before we do anything else, let's do the rundown so you guys know how to contact us. Check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. Share it out with all your buddies and whatnot. Uh, it is winningcureseverything.com. We are on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. You can catch up with us on Twitter, at winningcures. You can also follow myself at Gary WCE. You can follow Chris at Chris B Giannini. That's C H R I S B G I A N N I N I. You can email the show Winning Cures Everything at gmail.com. You can also download, subscribe to, and review the podcast. That is on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all of your favorite podcast apps. We're also doing something pretty cool with iTunes. So for every 25 five-star written reviews that we receive, the first $25 will go to St. Jude. The next 25 will go to Le Bonner, The next 25 to St. Jude. The next 25 to Le Bonner, And so on and so on. So every time you leave a review, you are helping out. So we are going to be donating every 25 reviews that we get. So help us out there. Do that thing on iTunes if you have an iPhone or a Mac or whatever. Um, you can also listen to the show on Local X, localxradio.com, the Local X app on your smartphone, every Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. Today's show is being brought to you by Kyle Seeger's Designs. If you need great, affordable web design for your company, business, or just personally, check out kyleseegers.com. He can handle all of your web development needs, including site building, maintenance, branding, and more. For more information, visit Kyle Seeger's Designs at kyleseegers.com. Today is going to be a shorter show than usual, but it is a good one. We can guarantee that. Let's jump right into it. After the break, we're going to welcome in USA Today's Dan Wolken. This is Gary Seegers from Winning Cures Everything, and I know you're looking for new gear for college football season. If that's the case, check out the new online store at winningcureseverything.com. We've got new WCE shirts in all sizes with all your favorite SEC colors. Just click on the store tab at Winning Cures Everything. Com. We're getting closer to football season, but man, it is still hot outside. And there's nothing worse than not knowing who to call if your air conditioning goes out. If you're in Memphis, we've got you hooked up. Jay Billings with Desired Comfort Specialists is quick, dependable, and he's available day or night for all your HVAC service, repairs, and installations. All you have to do is give him a call, 901-605-7650. So when your AC goes out, you know who to call to get it taken care of. Look him up on Facebook at Desired Comfort Specialist or call Jay Billings at 901-605-7650. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything on Local X. Uh, Right now we want to welcome in college football writer for USA Today, a man who has been all over the latest Ole Miss news. He is Dan Wolken. You can follow him on Twitter at Dan Wolken. Dan, thanks for hopping in with us today, my friend. Hey, how's it going? Oh, uh, everything is fine in this part of the world. Uh, first off, I got to ask you what uh, what it seems like everybody on social media wants to know: Why do you hate Ole Miss so much? <laughs> well, for fifteen years, and uh, whenever there's a school that is in the crosshairs of the NCAA and gets a lot of attention from people like me, whether it's uh, Penn State or Miami, Ohio State, you know, no, nobody likes to hear the bad news about the program that they root for. And so whenever it, you it focus a, a lot on, yeah. on, that ba- on that bad news, it's always, it's, it's, you know, it's never about, uh, for, for that subgroup of people, it's never about the, the facts or the story it's you have to have an agenda well um 
not you know, necessarily, if that's right? The case, I've, I've had I've had agendas over the years. If that's if that's the case against uh, pretty much everybody in the NCAA, I guess. Exactly. It, seriously, I mean, it can be a difficult job to uh, to do something like this because of the backlash from fans. Like I heard you on Bo Bounds earlier, and you brought the heat. Like it was fun to listen to because you you laid out the truth. And lately, because of the news that you've received from different sources, the backlash has come from Ole Miss fans in extraordinary ways. And have you run into backlash like this? You know, from any other well, fan base? No. Yeah, I mean, look, my thing from the beginning of this case, uh, from what I had seen, from what I had heard, and from what I knew, my conclusion was that Ole Miss was was playing a very bad hand here, Um, that there had been widespread violations inside the program, that it had been done in a fairly systematic way, and the the NCAA was not going to stop until they had had laid all of this out in in a pretty um, in a pretty clear and and comprehensive manner, and that at that point, uh, Ole Miss really their only option was to to kind of nuke the whole thing and start over. That was my conclusion, and um, as more has come out, it's it's obvious that that what I had said all along was, was correct. But at the same time, you have a lot of media sources within the state of Mississippi, people who are, uh, I, th- I would say, especially uh, the, the, you know, the fan centric sites. And there's a lot of them that, that cover the Ole Miss program um, have sort of rolled with a different narrative. And, it's it's been uh, one thing after another. Whether it's you know the investigation is over, it's it's mostly Houston Nut era and women's basketball and track. Uh, you know, freezes and implicated. Um, it's all old stuff. I, there's just been this whole series of, of of things, and then excuses, and then conspiracies, and it's moved into you know uh, it's it's Dan Mullen's fault. It's you know, Steve Robertson, uh, who's a scout writer for Mississippi State, uh, set up this whole thing. And, you know, it's all gotten a little bit silly. Uh, it's gotten quite silly. And, and I think that we, we live in an era, not just in sports, but in, in society, now where you can kind of choose your own picture when it comes to the, what the news is and what the truth is. And, uh, you know, sadly, uh, a lot of. Oh, Ole Miss hardcore fans have bought into uh, people who were were giving them n- not the real picture of of what was going on in their program, and and you know slowly it's it's becoming public everything that happened, and, uh, and they know, don't like still, it. Still, <laughs> yeah, and and, and it, nobody nobody likes to to hear the bad news about themselves. I mean that's just the way it is. Exactly. Now you you brought up uh, nuking. You know the program, and not the program, but just the all the people that were associated yeah. with this, right? And and I feel yeah. like the NCAA would have uh, would have looked more kindly on that. Um, I went on Bo's show. I I mean, it's been a few weeks now, and I brought up the idea that maybe they're not doing that because of what happened with Billy Brewer back in the mid '90s, where they fired him before all of the stuff came out. And they still got hammered by the NCAA, and then they lost a lawsuit to Brewer where they had to pay him, you know, four year salary because his name was not implicated in whatever. Like all of his stuff got thrown out. Um, it, do you think there's any chance that that might be what happened here? Oh, uh, look, I mean, they had significant financial uh, incentive to to let Freeze sort of. Uh, uh, flame out whatever way he he was going to flame out, whether that was the NCAA or or what actually happened. Um, But I also think that, that the school had there, if you read what the NCAA has presented, the school had plenty of ammunition to make a football coaching change, uh, whether uh, through some sort of negotiated settlement or, or simply for cause. Um, by the fact that, that Freeze was uh, charged with failure to monitor, and, and I, I think the NCAA makes a pretty compelling case about a lot of the 
a lot of the uh, shenanigans that were going on within and around the program. So, um, look, I, I, I think for the most part, the reason why they didn't fire Hugh Freeze is because the the big money inside that program didn't want Hugh Freeze fired. Uh, I, I agree. You know, the, a coach who had, had recruited at this exceptionally high level, uh, historic, you know, basically compared to the history of Ole Miss, a coach who um, had beaten Alabama twice. I mean, I, I think people sort of had this fantasy that he could, you know, ride it out, you know, ri- ride out this, this problem and it would all go back to normal at some point. And it just, I think, you know, if, if you have a, a real understanding of the NCAA process and the severity of what he was charged with, you, you knew that that, that wasn't going to happen, but it took, uh, it took outside events for people to finally realize it. Absolutely. All right. Now, before we jump into the NCAA response to Ole Miss, which I definitely want to dive into a little bit of that, let's dig into this uh, Houston nut lawsuit against the Ole Miss Athletic Foundation and the uh, IHL board, et cetera, et cetera. The lawsuit was thrown out of district court Wednesday. Uh, Ole Miss fans took that as a win. And then Tom Morris puts out a statement afterwards, and I quote it here. It says, I concurred with Bubba's suggestion that we oblige Ole Miss, ask the court to grant their jurisdictional uh, motion, and file an updated state court lawsuit next week with more details than those that were known to us when we filed suit. I get the feeling that getting Houston Nut paid may not be the only thing that's going on here. Uh, what do you take you know, from this statement? Yeah, look, there's obviously a big back and forth that's gone on. Um, I think Ole Miss has not really taken this lawsuit very seriously, despite the fact that that what was discovered in in the in the process ultimately led to Hugh Freeze being fired. I don't think they've taken the, the Houston Nut allegations uh, seriously, and you know maybe there's a good reason for that. Maybe. Uh, they feel like that there's no chance that Houston Nut can prove damages in court and that this will all go away before it ever gets to that point. And even if it does, they have the better argument legally. Um, I am not here to judge whether that's true or not. I think just in general, it's it's very difficult to win damages. But I I think Ole Miss is sort of underestimating uh, just sort of the nuisance factor of it and that uh, it's uh, th- there's this is all going to continue on, and you know that the people representing Houston and uh, there's a, a sort of growing team of people who've been looking into this into into this uh, situation. Y- you know the the potential for them finding more damaging, explosive information. Uh, I think they I think is is something that they should take seriously because it's. It's an unnecessary it, gasoline on the fire, uh, potentially. And I just think that given the position they're in, I personally would be trying to make this thing go away as quickly as possible, but they've taken a different tack. Exactly. exactly. Now, let's uh, let's hop off the lawsuit. Obviously, there's a million more things going on down in Oxford. I told anybody that would listen that if Ole Miss did not release the NCAA response soon after they received it, it could not be good news. And there are so many details yep. to go through in this document. It, first off... It, Let's jump on this. The allegation that Ole Miss fans have been screaming would be thrown out. What did you make of the NCAA standing by every allegation in the NOA and including Leo Lewis as a, quote, credible witness? Well, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm not particularly surprised. Uh, I think there's been a lot of misinformation that's been put out there about the immunity process and how how somebody like Leo Lewis ends up talking to the NCAA to begin with and sort of the circumstances around that. I mean, they, the NCAA, they don't, they don't have subpoena power. Um, but what they do have, particularly with regard to current student athletes and coaches is they have a lot of leverage over, over those people to cooperate in investigations. And so when they receive information, they, they're not just going to Mississippi State and saying, hey, let's talk to a bunch of recruits and see what kind of dirt we can dig up on Ole Miss. That's not how it works. Um, it, really what happens is they, they have to act on a specific 
a specific piece of information that they've gotten that, that people in what they call development, which is just sort of like, you know, what they hear, what, what you hear on the street, you know, what, right. whatever rumors are out there about, about uh, what's going on behind the scenes in college football. So they need specific information and they need a reason to go to the committee on a fractions chair and say, let's give somebody immunity. Um, and when that offer is made, uh, the, the, wh- whoever is, is talking to the NCAA is allowed to get, um, is allowed to get representation, but they are, are really not allowed to discuss anything about it. And, um, uh, you know, Dan Mullen would certainly be informed that one of his players uh, was requested to talk to the NCAA, but I I don't think he would he would know exactly what what uh, what that player is being asked about. The only thing you, you really can tell the player is just to be truthful, because if you're not truthful, and the NCAA knows you're not truthful, you risk your eligibility. Well, it's so Des Bryant all over again. Right, Des Bryant lied about a minor detail. And, and he lost his college eligibility. Um, so all of the incentive structure of this process is is to tell the truth for, for the student-athlete, and particularly when you're given immunity. In other words, the NCAA goes in and tells Leo Lewis, look, we don't care what other violations you may have uh, committed or, or however else you may have compromised your eligibility. We want to know about your recruitment with Ole Miss and they ask questions. And I thought it was very notable in the NCAA's explanation that, that Lewis independently identified this attorney in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, the NCAA and Ole Miss did not know about those people's involvement at all. At that point, it was Lewis who identified who they were, identified their cars, um, identified their, physical descriptions and and their names as he knew them, the names he was told, identified how it all worked and and the communication via text and phone calls and whatnot. Um, And the NCAA does not just roll with that at that point. They test information out to see if it's credible, to see if if, if the stories, if if other things that that anyone they've given immunity – it checks out as truthful. Um, and, and so what they found is at every turn that the information he was providing them was good information. What they also found is that the people who were denying that they were involved in all this were consistently untruthful. Um, and so that's how they arrive at, at making this charge and believing Leo Lewis. And I think that the bar for Ole Miss or whoever to discredit that testimony is, is going to be pretty high. I I agree. Now, it, some of these violations are just a, kind of unheard of. There were numerous corners cut where they knew there were violations. They never reported them to compliance. Uh, things like the owner of Funkies being in the football facility talking to recruits, texting recruits before signing day, uh, and then lying about it when it's in his phone records, and he turned them over to the NCAA. Uh, yeah. Hugh Freeze lying about Hughes being in his home, uh, and then the recruits and Harris confirmed that he knew that Hughes was there. It, it's insane stuff. It it appears that lack of institutional control is going to stick, and so will Freeze's mm-hmm. failure to monitor. Now, you've studied NCAA sanctions and whatnot more than I have. What What is your best guess for sanctions that might be handed down, you know, in the next month, two months, three months? Well, I really, I really try not to guess specifically on on sanctions. Um, uh, and the reason is just because. Every case is different, and there's almost never a, a real precedent that that they can work off of. Um, and obviously, this case is, is very different than other cases, and, and so it's very hard to compare. It's a new group of people, and you're dealing with human beings. You know, sometimes, uh, you know, how they're feeling on a particular day about the case. Um, do they, you know, totally want to, um, you know, go go hard, go easy? the fact that freeze isn't there anymore. I mean, these are all complicating factors and how people will respond to what they read. Uh, I, I would say that, that everything I've seen in this case shows that the NCAA has put together a very compelling series of allegations uh, that, that are, are backed up by um, 
the best possible evidence that, that they can put together. And it, I would say most of this is, is going to stick. What does that mean in terms of penalties when you've already, you've already self-imposed a one-year ball ban and scholarship limits and disassociated boosters? I don't know. But just working off the rule of thumb that it's always worse than what you self-impose, uh, I think lack of institutional control probably sticks. And you know, I think they're at risk of a second-year bowl ban and at risk of more scholarship losses. I mean, I think this is a very, very serious case, and it's a very comprehensive case. And uh, I just I, I don't see how Ole Miss explains the way out of it. All right, now let's say for like in the future – more NCAA violations are found and turned in either right before or soon after the COI hearing. Do you think this is a case where the NCAA is finally just done in Oxford? Like, will they do their best <laughs> to stay out of town for a while? Or or is it something maybe they feel obligated to make sure that everything's found in violation, like it, it'll, it'll have to go punished? Well, I don't know. Um, I mean, it's a weird circumstance. On, sure, right. And, and look, I mean, at some point, you have to sort of say, you know, why are you killing something that's already dead? Right. You know, and and if, if, unless you want to give somebody the death penalty, and I just don't think that's ever going to happen again for a variety of reasons in the modern era of college football. <laughs> Too much money tied up. TV. <laughs> yeah. It, so, so really, what do you do? You know, and, and I just think that uh, – a couple year bull band, like how much worse can it really be? So yeah, who knows? But, but that, that's my sort of gut feeling is, you know, at some point you, you do kind of just have to say enough. All right. Now let's, uh, let, let's try and move away from that just a little bit onto a different topic. It will stay on Ole Miss, but nobody seems to be discussing the fact that this is going to be an incredibly difficult job to hire a new coach to at the four year limit mm-hmm. on employee contracts in Mississippi, the NCAA mess, the lawsuits, what do you think the best case scenario for a new head coach would be? Not necessarily naming names, just it, is anybody going to be interested in this job? Oh, sure. I mean, look, somebody, you know, people said the same thing about Baylor last year. And, uh, hey, Baylor hired a great coach in, in oh, yeah. that role. Um, so, yes, yeah, somebody will take the, their job. And, and you know, you, you, you will – we, we could potentially be in a year sitting here talking about, you know, what a great genius hire Ole Miss made. And, uh, you know, maybe the culture's really changing and, and things are kind of on the right track. It's, it's very possible. Uh, I, I don't know whether they're going to go that route or whether they're going to try to make a splash or try to go after the, you know, the hottest uh, major coach or, uh, you know, some sort of SEC coordinator. I, it's, it's, it's impossible for me to say it's way too early. Um, I think there's definitely going to be a lot of issues associated with the job, including the fact that, that the next coach is not going to be able to operate in the gray area whatsoever. Um, the stakes are going to be so high. You know, you got to hire somebody who's a hundred percent on the straight and narrow with regard to the rule book. And that, you know, that right off the bat eliminates a lot of people oh, yeah. um, whose reputations might, might precede them. Uh, so we'll see how all that works out, but they got a lot of time to think about it and evaluate and ask questions. And assuming Ross Bjork is still there and is the one making the hire, I mean, I think he, he will, you know, I don't know what the conclusion will be, but I'm sure he'll put together a very good process and um, come up with some interesting names and probably some names people aren't talking about right now. And Dan, I've kept you forever. Uh, we haven't done any college football preview for this season as of yet, but I'm planning on hopefully having you back on again. Give me some predictions. Who you got in your 14 playoff? Do you see any surprise teams, or or is college football just really turning into haves and have nots at this point? It's really been haves and have nots. You know, I know that everyone sort of likes the narrative of of the Power Five and. Um, you know, if you're on one side of the line, you got it made, and if you're on the other side of the line, you got no chance. I I, I tend to think things are a little more, um, a little more complicated than that. Uh, you know, because there's a lot of Power Five schools. I mean, half the Power Five schools, let's face it, cannot realistically ever win a national championship. Um, that's just it's just not they're just not built that way, and they're not going to be. 
you know, it's, it's, a, it's a handful, 10 programs maybe, that sort of take turns winning the whole thing. Uh, some, some are going to be up, some are going to be down. Uh, you're going to have a couple new shooters who, who come into the mix and then fall out of it like in Oregon. But we, we kind of know who, who the teams are that year in and year out are, are going to win 95, 99% of the titles. Um, and this year is no different. I mean, it's, it's Alabama, it's Florida state, it's, um, Ohio state, you know, Clemson, <laughs> Ohio state. Yeah. So, you know, so I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of surprises. Uh, but you know, I think obviously Alabama is your favorite to come out of the sec. I, I like Clemson a little better than Florida state. Uh, other people like Florida state, but I'd say one of those two will be in the playoff. Um, I'd say probably the, the big 10 champion, uh, if it's Ohio state probably gets in the playoff, uh, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's Penn state and you know, maybe it's Michigan. Um, then, then, you know, it's sort of the big 12 or the pac 12, uh, who gets a team in. And I tend to think, you know, Washington's pretty good. I, I tend to think Stanford and USC have a shot, you know, and then out of the big 12, Oklahoma, Oklahoma state. So th- those would sort of be my teams coming into the season. That I would look at as, you know, the real playoff contenders. No, I, I had planned on closing on that. You brought up Oklahoma. Do you see it? And, and we'll close on this one. Do you see any uh, any difference possibly in what goes on in Norman this year with a new head coach? I mean, it, June was a late, like a really late time to have a new coach, although he kept you know the whole staff and whatnot. Uh, there's not much changing, but I mean, you lose a guy that's a legend like Bob Stoops. Uh, I mean, there's only one way to go, you know, and that's down, right? I would imagine. I mean, look. Any first-time head coach is going to have a learning curve, and there are things that um, that uh, you know that, that he will be presented with in that job over the course of the first year, both on the field and off the field, that will test him in, in ways that you just don't don't get tested as an offensive coordinator. And and some people are cut out for that, some people are not, and and you know we'll find out with with Lincoln Riley. Uh, how that is, how that works. I, I, would, I would say on the other hand, he's a very talented coach. Um, I think he's got all the ingredients that will help make him successful, and it, it helps him that he inherits a good team right off the bat. Uh, but, you know, will the next 18 years of Oklahoma football be as good as the last 18? I would say probably not. Um, I think that's a way too high a bar for, for Lincoln Riley. But, um, you know, if you, if you get a chance to coach the Oklahoma Sooners at – you know, 36, 37 years old, um, you, you, you take that chance and, and you try to try to make the best of it. And uh, I think he'll I think he'll do that to the best of his ability. That's, you got that right. He is Dan Walken from USA Today. Follow him on Twitter, at Dan Walken. Dan, we really appreciate you coming on. I'm sure the next month is going to be incredibly interesting. Uh, I'll have to get you back on during the football season. Sounds good, buddy. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. This is Gary Seegers, your co-host and owner of Winning Cures Everything, the best sports blog and podcast in the South. There are a ton of ways that you can connect with us. First, check out the website, winningcureseverything.com. Second, give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. Third, follow us on Twitter, at winningcures, or myself, at ProSevereGary, or at Chris B. Giannini. Four, email the show. When he cures everything at gmail.com. Fifth, download, subscribe to, and review the podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all of your favorite podcast apps. We'll have new shows up every Tuesday and Friday morning along with different articles throughout the week. Remember, winningcureseverything.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris on Local X. Uh, we want to thank Dan Wolken for jumping in and discussing the Ole Miss NCAA mess and, and all of that stuff that's going on down in Oxford. Chris, right now, though, I want to talk to you about Josh Rosen. Uh, the UCLA quarterback said on Wednesday that football and school do not go together, and it created a whole lot of clickbait headlines, et cetera, et cetera. So let, let me go on and read you the full statement, okay? Uh, because it's a long article, it's a long interview, but this is the one that like really stood out. He said, look, football and school don't go together. They just don't. Trying to do both is like trying to do two full-time jobs. There are guys who have no business being in school, but they're here because this is the path to the NFL. There's no other way. 
Then there's the other side that says raise the SAT eligibility requirements. Okay, raise the SAT requirement at Alabama and see what kind of team they have. You lose athletes, and then the product on the field suffers. Now, initially, before I read the the interview in its entirety, I just looked at all the clickbait headlines, you know, the raise the SAT requirements at Alabama and see what kind of team they have, and the whole football and school don't go together. And I, like a lot of people, chalked it up to, ah, he's just a spoiled, rich West Coast kid complaining about having to go to school. But that wasn't it at all. Rosen actually wants to go to school and gets frustrated when there are classes that he cannot take because of his football schedule. Now, I think he's 100% right on this. Uh, football player schedules are hard. It's difficult to do. How do you feel about this? Like, what, what are your thoughts on what he said? I think he's right. Um, that, that was exactly what I was going to say. I, I actually agree with just about everything he says. So there's a lot of folks that say, well, it's not a full-time job football. They can only practice 20 hours a week. But if you think these guys are only practicing 20 hours a week and they are still maintaining their scholarship level of play and that's accepted from the coaches, then you're wrong. You're just wrong. Um, these coaches are, are kind of wink, wink, nod, nod, instructing these guys, hey, y'all need to get together on your own, lift weights. What do they call they that? Shave. Voluntary well, workouts. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And 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 it so it is a full time job. And my immediate reaction is maybe this will spark the conversation of you know players kind of maybe getting compensated. But the more I thought of it, this is not a compensation problem. It there's there's only 168 hours. Just, that's just it. That's all there is. You yeah. can't make more. And so the time problem. If you have two full-time jobs, being compensated for one of the jobs monetarily doesn't make your life any less stressful or any more difficult. And and so I, I couldn't imagine what it would have been like. I worked a full-time job and went to school. Uh, but I but I went to school very part-timely while working these jobs. I was not an athlete, not anywhere close to one. I don't know what it would have been like to have to maintain full-time status as a student maintain basic level grades to stay eligible which a lot of people laugh at and say that's not real hard you know i don't i don't know that i agree with that school wasn't very easy for me so it it was something that i found difficult uh and then and then also maintain a second full-time job that everything in the world that you're doing relies on that job all of your future relies on that job not this degree yeah. So, so I don't even know that compensating players makes this better or worse, but I don't know how to fix it. I, I definitely agree with him, though. Yeah, I mean, he, he goes through the article multiple times and talks about, you know, if I wanted it to just be easy, then I would just take, you know, I would uh, major in sociology, right? But he wants to go and he wants to, he wants to be a business major. He wants to create his own business and all that. And it, it, it's tough to... Uh, it's tough to do that when, you know, he brought up one instance. There was a class that he really wanted to take, and they only offered it, you know, it's only one class, but it conflicted with his uh, with his football schedule. So, like, how do you even begin to discuss that with, uh, with kids like that? I mean, I tell them, well, sorry, you got to take it over summer? I mean, it, what are you supposed to do? Yeah, I don't know, and that's, that's a difficult thing. You've got a kid that wants to be in school. And he wants to take some of these classes that are going to make him better for if football doesn't work out for him, uh, which is a smart thing to do. It's what we tell kids. It's the reason we say we are getting a degree, and that degree has a monetary value. All the people that want to fight you on paying players says your degree has value. It, it, is, it, is, it, it should be capable compensation. And, um, and he's not even able to take the right classes that he wants or needs for his degree I, I don't know. I like conversations like this being had just because I want I want more people to to discuss this stuff. I want more people to talk about this stuff. Um, just so just so maybe there will be some changes in the way college football is, is done or, or college athletics in general are handled. But football is the biggest. It takes far more time than any other sport. It also costs far more money to run. Um and, and and you know the pressures of these these athletes is tough, man. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm not saying you know that they they should 
just, you know, toughen up and whatever. But at the same time, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, college sports weren't what they, what they are today. You know, they just, don't, they just weren't. They, they weren't the mega bit. They've always been big business, but they weren't the mega business that, that they are today. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's nuts. He goes on to say in this thing, it, he said, uh, uh, good gracious, he said, uh, it's uh, human beings don't belong in school with our schedules. No one in their right mind should have a football player's schedule and go to school. It's not that some players shouldn't be in school. It's just that universities should help them more instead of just finding ways to keep them eligible. Uh, and he said, any time any player puts into school is going to take away from the time they could put into football. And they don't realize that. Uh, they don't realize they're getting screwed until it's too late. You've got a bunch of people at universities who are supposed to help you out, and they're more interested in helping you stay eligible. At some point, universities have to do more to prepare players for university life and help them succeed beyond football. Uh, he said there's so much money being made in this sport, it's a crime to not do everything you can to help the people who are making it for those who are spending it. Like, this this yeah. kid is, uh, what, what do he they call starts. it? Yeah, he's he's sharp. They they call it woke, right? Like, he's woke. He he gets this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, he, under, he understands big picture. He absolutely does. That's you got that right. All right, we'll uh we'll jump off this. Let's uh let's go on and move on from this. Uh you know what? Let's take a break. Let's take a break. And we'll come back with another segment after this. Uh coming up next on Winning Cures Everything, we're gonna jump into a new segment. We call it the Friday Five. It's got five different topics for us to discuss, uh both sports and just uh just world. And we'll do that right after this on Winning Cures Everything on Local X. This is Gary, host of Winning Cures Everything. If you're looking for affordable custom web design, business cards, brochures, and more, check out Kyle Seegers Designs at kyleseegers.com. Kyle offers full website design, monthly site maintenance, and content management system training. Remember, for all your web design needs, check out kyleseegers.com. That's K-Y-L-E-S-E-G-A-R-S.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris on Local X Radio. We have got a new segment that will be up every Friday called the Friday Five. Now, Chris, all this is is I'm going to read off some topics, and you and I are going to discuss for uh, you know about two minutes each, whatever it is, and we'll move on to the next one from there. But it's basically uh, you know how we always talk about rapid fire, like that's that's what yes, this sir. is. So let's uh, let's jump into the first one. All right, first off, Greg Doyle, who writes for the Indianapolis Star, he was on the Gary Paris show yesterday, uh, sorry, on Wednesday, and he discussed a picture of a, a little boy playing basketball on a goal that was attached to a barn in Indiana. And he, he just saw it and thought it was an awesome picture. He took the picture, he hashtagged our game, and put it out on social media. And as soon as he did, very, very, uh, very Hoosier like. Yes, it, exactly. Yeah, I mean, right, he's in Indiana. Yeah, he's in Indiana. So yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Somebody responded and immediately said it doesn't have a female in the picture, and then somebody else responded and said it doesn't have anyone of color in the picture. Now, how infuriating do you think it is to have to deal with something like that every time you post anything? Man, I mean it's. It's the world we live in, which I, I, I'm not a fan of that. But, I mean, I understand about equality and I understand all that. But, but at the same time, it's a picture. Like, those people weren't standing in the in the picture. Like, yeah. you know, it was natural, organic picture. And, and so, therefore, that's what it was. So, you know, and it was talking about basketball. Basketball is an American game. It's our game. I don't, I don't understand – you know, whoever the photographer was, I guess, should have just ran and got a bunch of other people to stand there and stare at the goal also. I don't think there was anybody. He was at a friend's house. Like, I don't think there was anybody else out there. <laughs> like, you, I mean, you get what I'm saying. Though. Yeah. Like that, you know, that's the concept of, of where we are. You shouldn't have posted that unless you've got a bunch of people. And or maybe he shouldn't have hashtagged it our game, I guess. You know, people can get upset about that, but which is just you know, bananas. Like we're, we're just so sensitive today, and and I'm all for not being rude, and I'm all for not being a bully, and and I'm all for you know inclusion and stuff. But at the same time, you know, this this had nothing to do with any of the things 
that people are making it out to be. Well, everybody's so, just looking for something to get pissed off about. That's all it is. Yeah. So the whole thing just blows me away. Uh, speaking of blowing me away, Zach Randolph arrested on felony drug charges in Los Angeles. Now, have you seen oh, about this? Oh, so hard. Yeah, it, 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 did, it, did it really surprise you that like what surprised me is the fact that he was suspended or not suspended he was uh he was arrested for felony drug possession in a state that has legalized marijuana uh, that, that okay that was my first question my first comment on Facebook as soon as I saw it is I thought it was legal there like I understand the people are going to come at us and say what's well, not legal on a federal level but I don't think he was arrested by an FBI you know. No, no, he he was arrested because uh, he had a bunch on him, so it was intent to sell. So that's that's because somebody somebody with his his amount of money and prestige shouldn't be able to buy a lot. Well, that, that's what blows my mind is he had a bunch of other people around him. Like, you better have somebody else carrying that stuff, man. You got it. it who was it that? Oh, it was Chris Carter. Oh man, listen, that's but that's that. And let me tell you something. This wouldn't have happened had he still been in Memphis. He could have been caught with all that weed, and nobody would have said a damn word. He'd have got a police escort home, and nobody would have said nothing to to anybody. Exactly. And that's how Memphis rolls. You got that right. And and some people can say that that's wrong, but a full crap. It, not to me. Nobody about weed. Exactly. That, that's not some gangster out here shooting up kids and slanging dope to little kids. Okay. All yeah. right. He's a grown ass man. And he wants to smoke up. He takes the pain away. I've talked to so many athletes at just a, a college level that I've known over the years and talked to about the pain. And all these doctors do is just hand them opioids, just pump them full of hardcore narcotics. Man, the hell with that. That's crazy. He's a grown-ass man. He makes a ton of money. He's in a state where it's legal. So even in Memphis, at least, it would have been frowned upon because it's against the law. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just it blows my mind. The whole thing's ridiculous. Uh, they can't buy it at Costco, so if buys in bulk, it's wrong. If buys in bulk, it's wrong. But if he gets caught with an eighth, nobody cares because it's L.A. I know like, that's crazy. It, it you think, is. You think he, you see how much money that guy's made over his years? You think he's out here slinging weed, dropping, yeah, you know, dropping eighths and quarters off to, to kids, man? Come, like, come on. Yourself. I agree. I agree. All right, Deshaun Watson and uh, Deontay Foreman. Are going to be awesome for the Texans. So we uh, we got to see him Wednesday night <laughs> against the Panthers. I'm officially on the Deshaun Watson bandwagon after seeing that game. He showed signs of it. I, I'm already look. Daxon is done. Deshaun Watson Daxon is the out. man. Daxon out. Daxon out. That's old, a look, old man. Here's his numbers. All right, he went 15 out of 25 for 179 yards. He ran three times for 24 yards and one touchdown. And it, dude. Foreman from Texas, like he was a Longhorn last year. He came out early. I think he went in what third, fourth round, something like that. Like he had nine rushes for seventy-six yards. He had a long of forty-one yards. I mean, the dude is like it. it it's going to be for real. Like I, th- I think this is a match made in heaven. I think the Texans are going to be for real this year. Okay. But what do you think? Did you get to watch it? Man, I think it's preseason football. I think Watson could be good. I'm not saying he's going to be terrible. I'm not going to say he's going to be the, the second coming of Tom. Okay. <laughs> but he could be good. I think he could be good. You know? I think with that team around him, I think he could be real good. Hell, it's it's... Way, but you said the same thing about Dak last year. And, and I, I was right. Last year he, and then, but now all of a sudden he's a bum and he's all. You're all. Like, how right were you if it's only a one-hit wonder? That's my question. I think he'll still be all right this year. I don't think he'll be what he was because he came in and nobody knew what to expect from him. I think Deshaun Watson will take the same thing. I'm not saying Deshaun Watson is going to be good forever. I think he's going to be real good for the Texans this year. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to disagree with that. But maybe <laughs> I, I, I disagreed last year and I was wrong. All right. So. All right. We'll, we'll see if I can go but two I'm for two. I'm not saying he's going to be a bum, but I just don't see him being unworldly great. That offense is just not great. It's just not. I can understand. I mean, but remember, they had Brock Osweiler leading it last year. Who else? Tom Savage? I mean, come on. <laughs> I, well, he hasn't got the starting job yet, so. True, true. You're right. You're right. All right, number four, there was a giant chicken with Trump hair, inflatable chicken with Trump hair that was blown up on the White House lawn. Did you see this? 
I did not see this. There is this no is the news. Time. There's no news about where it came from or, or who did it or anything, but the pictures of this thing, it, it's a giant inflated chicken with like a Trump wig on it. And it's as big as the White House. And they just inflated it right there in front of the lawn. Like, <laughs> it's the funniest looking thing I have ever seen. And I have no idea what they've done with it. Like, I can't find anything else about it. But that is, like, you want to talk about stuff that's going crazy in this country? Like, How, how did somebody get on the White House lawn with something like this? Because those things take a while to blow up. Exactly. Like, you don't just push a button and it blows up. Like, they're, they're a good, you know, 10, 15-minute inflatable time. That's it. And, and on top of that, wh- like, why? Like, what is the purpose of this? Somebody with too much time and too much money. Yeah. It just wants to wants to be goofy, man. We live in a world where, where people just want to be goofy. That's it. And And look, I'll admit this. Like, this is some funny stuff. Oh, it's funny. <laughs> It's funny. I mean, but it, you know, I don't know that I'm risking my freedom for funny. Not like that. Oh, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, oh, you know what? All right. So there's a story like literally just came out on the, uh, at the New York Times. It was the brainchild of Taryn Singh Brar, an artist and documentary filmmaker who lives in Laredo, California. Uh, he said by phone on Thursday, it took four months of planning before he could get permits from the National Park Service to bring it to fruition. Uh, he said he wanted to make, oh, good Lord, he wanted to make a statement about the president being a weak and ineffective leader. <laughs> because he's, quote, unquote, playing chicken with North Korea. Like, give me a break. So, so this cat got permits for this. Like, there were government officials that signed off on it and said, it's okay, you can do this. Yes. That's, somebody's going to lose that job. <laughs> All right. I don't know who. But, but somebody, somebody can fire. Yeah, you got somebody that right. All right, uh, number five. <laughs> number five, let's close this thing out. Uh, Les Miles is now on Twitter. And I know that you were excited about this. We, uh, we, we hit up Coach Miles. He has not responded yet. We want him on the show. We got Tim Brando's blessing on Twitter. Tim told him to come on the show. So we'll see. But he, he announced today that he will be a TV analyst this year. Uh, he did not announce who for. Uh, the only company that he mentioned that he has met with is Fox. And all the different reporter calls that have gone into Fox have uh, have gone unresponded to. So, you know, what what do you think? What do you think about him being a TV well, I'm analyst? I'm, I'm, I'm super excited. I'm glad he's going to be back on TV. I want to be able to watch him. Um, I, I've been wanting this for a long time. I wanted it last year. Um, you know, I thought since he got fired in the middle of the year, we wouldn't get it. But uh, this year, I'm I'm glad I can see more or less. He he was unbelievable, uh, and so so this is something I'm excited about. I, I'm actually pretty much as soon as you texted me and told me you DM'd him to come on the show, like I started getting like fast heart beating and like a little bit of panic attack <laughs> because because I, I don't you know I'm not saying that that. You know, I just don't know that I'll be able to compose myself too well. Um, I love the man for so long, and and I'm a nobody to him. I'm just a dude, okay? I'm like one of those crazy people that that he probably wants to stay real far away from. So, but yeah. I got nothing but good things to say about him. Oh, absolutely! Hey, he's so charismatic. He's he's got such a good personality. Uh, I think he's going to do great on TV. You know, I know well, he wants to be gonna, a coach. Well, I thought we were going to be awesome on TV last year, so. Yeah, I think I think you will. Agreed. Agreed. All right, that's going to wrap it up. Let's uh let's get out of here. We'll do the rundown. To close us out, this is how you contact us. Check out the website winningcureseverything.com. You can get us on Facebook, facebook.com/winningcureseverything. You can follow us on Twitter at Winning Cures. You can follow myself at Gary WCE. You can follow Chris at Chris B G N N E. That's C H R I S B G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. You can email the show, winningcureseverything at gmail.com. You can also download, subscribe to, and review the show at iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, 
all of your favorite podcast apps. I promise we are on all of them. <sighs> and on Local X. LocalXRadio.com. The Local X app on your smartphone. Every Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. We are right here. So, until next week, you guys do what you do. Keep sharing out the page. We appreciate your support. We'll see you next Tuesday. Hey, this is Gary Seegers, host of The Stage View. Make sure and tune in to Local X's first morning sports show, Winning Cures Everything, with myself and Chris Giannini every Tuesday and Friday at 9 a.m. Check out the site and grab the podcasts at winningcureseverything.com.